good afternoon everybody so i mean this is one of the success story of a sub unit rabies vaccine which was developed indigenously first time in the world and i would like to take you through what we did why we did how we did and what we achieved and i would like to also tell you that all that you start there is a take transfer done by somebody or done by in house does not lead to approval so you should be mindful that approval is a chance and not a great science can i have the slides can i go without slides So, see, as you know, I mean, rabies is a disease of third world countries, and so we realize that whatever advancements has taken place, that technology, novel technologies, will not be applied to the rabies vaccine by the vaccine manufacturers of the developed world, and it is our own problem, and we have to solve it and fix it. So, next. So, if you know that. i mean it is most dreaded disease is 100% fatality 100% preventable and still we have a largest number of rabies induced death in india around the world if you look at development of a rabies vaccine it started with pasteur who used live organism on a spinal cord which were attenuated and spinal cord used to be transferred and injected it had a lower immunogenicity and it had to be prepared fresh so if you know during that time frame around the world pasteur institute came up just to prepare fresh and give it to the people then uh, fermi started doing phenol inactivated and from spinal cord it went up to the brain then sample in 1911 standardized that okay what should be the brain content so he standardized the protein content the rabies virus content etc in a very crude way and uh, then it went to cell culture based vaccine using various cell culture techniques so if you look at it sample vaccine was a better immunogenicity had a self life and so from multiple doses given daily it came down to 14 doses over 14 days and when there was a cell culture based vaccine there was improved immunogenicity life license was done to improve the self life and it became a five dose vaccine it only tells you that if you keep applying the modern science and technology you can improve immunogenicity of the product and this is just to tell you how it was so originally people used to give around 30 injections and that too injections will not be containing the same amount of virus so it is increasing potency of injection subsequently so first injection is say x next will be 1.5 x 2 x like that for 31 days so it has to be prepared fresh then it came to 14 injections of 5 ml each and i remember this because i have taken this 14 injections two times in the childhood so i know how painful it is okay. so and then came five dose vaccine which is 0.5 to 1 ml okay but if you look at it the regimen is little complicated 0 37 that's fine but then it comes at the end of 7 days and then it comes at the end of 14 days so it's very complicated regime to bring the patient in i mean it's basically endemic in the developing world and 5000 deaths 59000 out of that maximum is in india but if you look at a problem as a problem what is known is that up to three injections the compliance is very good because it's the easy 037 but beyond that i mean large number of drop out and non compliance starts so i mean different literature gives you different numbers but it can be as i as for a four injection 47.4% or for five injection 54.20% so vaccines do not work adequately because they have not received the full amount so the challenge when we started looking at is can we improve immunogenicity so standard way of improving is add adjuvant and we did that as well uh, so we had a 
novel vaccine technology platform which you can use like mRNA vaccine, genetically modified vaccine, viral vector, subunit ribose G protein, that's our product. So at the end we are not happy, though we achieved the goal, but we are not happy. So if you look at approved adjuvant, LM does not increase the immune response with rabies vaccine, it does not work. Our own adjuvant, three dose was good, but it does not provide it, the amount of zero protection which we needed on day 14. Okay. So then there are other adjuvants which are tried, and the maximum somebody could achieve was one week, five injections, it was possible to achieve, but then five is too high. Okay. Then uh, mRNA vaccine, CureVac started with it, but uh, it did not get where it wanted to, so it was dropped. Genetically modified went the same story. So people have tried viral vector, not good. So we looked at it, so what is that which provides immunogenicity? So if you look at it, it's a G protein, which is a small tiny amount of the virus, rest is adventitious tissue. So can we do something with G protein? And it is only structural protein which induces immune response and it is known that it can be protective and literature says 9 nanogram of G protein is equivalent to 1.63 microgram of virus so all that suggested that G protein may be the right candidate because it's also responsible for neutralizing antibody and this was literature which provided that okay various people tried to make subunit vaccine and dropped it somewhere, but various attempts made. So there are various types. I won't go into the details. For the, so this is our efforts and our story. So it's approved in India, luckily for us, before pandemic. Okay. So it was approved, and I'll just tell you what it is. Everybody has known Covax, so it's the same technology. You have a baculovirus, which contains protein of interest, you grow them, purify them, and it provides trimers. So this is a recombinant nanoparticle, rabies vaccine, and if you look at on the electron microscopy, it gives you trimer. And uh, I mean, I'm just showing some of the preclinical information. So two dose vaccine, very small amount, 0.25 IU, compared to, uh, I mean, Rebipur 0.25 IU, which is standard, we gave 5 microgram of our protein and it gave almost identical data with 2 dose. We have a 1 dose, 2 dose, 3 dose, all the data. I'm not showing that. So then what we realize is even when you have a different batches, there's a consistency. So if you look at antibody response generated by rabies G protein versus conventional rabipur, there's a batch to batch consistency is very good compared to what is available in the market. Then we did standard things, so I won't go into those details for the sake of time. And this is a phase one study which we did. So this phase one study had 17 arms. One arm was a control, which is Rebipur, given in a standard dose. And then we included four dose regime by four different regimens of in injections. So total there were 17 arms. And this is the data. There was hardly any assay of significance. And uh, most frequent A's were headache, muscle pain, tiredness, which is, I mean, not of a significant. So it was well tolerated, no safety concern. But if you look at this graph, zero protection level, zero, three, two dose regimen was also good. And at all dose level, 5, 10, 20, 50 microgram, zero, seven was also good, zero, three, seven. So all four into four, 16 regimen worked well in the phase one, but there's a small number. So we enlarged the number in the phase two and we selected two dose and two dose regimen and this was taken into phase two and then the number increased while well, the number of um, trial went down from 17 to five and each vaccine group had 50, 50, 50. And similarly, it was well tolerated. If you look at it, when we expanded, on day 270, 50 microgram maintained the immunogenicity while rest of them dropped it, including Rabipur. So we conducted phase three, still larger, 800 volunteers in 2 to 1 randomization. This is a sequence, what we did, what we did not do. And then if you look at it, 
adverse event profile was manageable, if not less, it was comparable between the two arms. And this is what the zero protection level we found. And all three phase vaccine, zero protection, tighter, were managed by WHO collaborative center in a blinded manner. So it passed the test and vaccine was approved. So basically, it is comparable to five dose Rebipur with a better safety profile. And so you can have a first subunit vaccine with three dose regimen. And these are publications. And then subsequently, since it's a protein which induces T cell response, we did a small animal study. And if you look at that, at 83 or 12 weeks, with a single injection, the antibody titer drops. And at that point in time, if you give a second injection, there's a sudden boost. So by day two, you achieve protective titer, which is known as anamnestic list. And this is known for T cell responses. Okay, then we looked at, we plan to have a five antigenic site, but how do we prove it? So these are the antigenic sites which are present. And uh, what we did is we looked at what are the monoclonal antibodies and how it reacts to that. And luckily, we could show that it reacts to all monoclonal antibodies which are available commercially, whether it's a rabies shield or a uh, shield. So this is the last slide. This is a sentence from our chairman. He believes that the true celebration of research lies as much in invention as in making the medicine affordable to the last man in society. So in spite of being unique vaccine, spent so much resources, it is still prized at as good as five dose rabies vaccine. Thank you very much. Okay, can I leave? <laughs> so if there are no questions, thank you very much. Yeah, okay, go ahead. Hello, sir. So thank you very much. Nice presentation here. Uh, sir, uh, you, you are uh, showing the uh, compliance for the dosing. Uh, so when we are saying that, is it for uh, every dog bite or is it for rabbit dog bite compliance? Unfortunately, that data is not available in public domain. See, okay. we go by whatever is available in the public domain. But there is a, I mean, I can't go into more details, but there's something called a vaccine failure because of the vaccine fail, and there is something vaccine failure because of the compliance. Okay? And vaccine failure is by and large because the cold chain was not maintained properly. This is well documented in the literature. Yes. So, uh, just wanted to understand, if we are having this tighter value, as you have explained, uh, during the trials itself, why the booster dose recommendation in COVID came at a later stage? I mean, uh, you want me to uh, you want me to answer COVID-related questions? No, not exactly. I just wanted to understand why the requirement of a booster dose in COVID case came at a later stage. Why it didn't happen at the initial phase of the therapy determination or regime? Okay. okay, I can answer that in two different ways. So the first part is everybody was in a hurry to get something out. And there was no time for trial and error. Okay? So whatever they felt appropriate, if you look at Oxford vaccine and publication, they changed the doses regime during phase three also. Okay? Two doses given at this time frame, this time frame, and everybody was jumbled up. And that's the reason US FDA did not approve for a long time till they did a second phase three. So, but everybody was in a hurry to identify. See, whatever little protection you have, you don't have a time to wait for the long term. So and as I mentioned in the morning, I mean, Pfizer guy openly mentioned that if I have to develop a new vaccine for epidemic, I'll get it in four months. I will not do any animal studies. And if you don't do animal studies, you don't know what is the period during which it lasts. And then if you look at it, it was happening so rapidly. Phase one khatam hua, uske pehle phase two shuru hota tha. Phase two khatam hua, uske pehle phase three shuru hota tha. Okay? So everybody was in a top gear. So when you are in a top gear, as she will agree, accidents are bound to happen. 
and we have to correct them subsequently. So I had a con question in continuation to that. Yeah. Uh, still on rabies, sir. Here, sir. Last row. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. Sir, uh, when we were also talking about the immunological response, yeah. uh, what was the end point which was being seen at and how long that coverage was there for the recipients of vaccine? Okay. So, I mean, in a phase 2 study, we followed it up to 270 days. In a phase 3, because of the limitations of the number of analytes they can handle, we did up to 90 days. Okay. Because, see, it's a WHO collaborating center is doing blindly and they have limited resources. So we went up to day 90. We have a samples, but uh, everybody says it's not required. If you achieve this, you don't have to go beyond this. So we still have a reserve samples. Thank you, sir. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. And I'll take your leave. Thank you.